So last week we looked at how this church was actually planted and I'm sure you can see that there was a price to pay and there always is a price to pay uh, whenever a church is planted. Of course Christ ultimately paid the price but also there is a price to pay for the people of God and I think we'd all agree that the church generally speaking in the West uh, has, been in, has, has been in cruise control for a very long time. We've been in cruise control and the times that we're going into demand that we take it out of cruise control and we really start to engage with what's going on. So one of the beautiful things about Philippians is you're going to see a wonderful model of the early church. When people say, well, what's the answer? Well, let's look at the early church. Well, this church was a church that Paul loved so much and they had such a relationship together. So you see the model of the early church in Acts but actually you see a lot in Philippians and Paul adored these people so much. So this was a Roman colony. Philippians was a Roman colony but it was, it was the gateway to Europe. It was a plain that had on either side of that plain huge mountain fortresses and the only way through to Europe was through Philippi. And so it really was the gateway to Europe and Paul knew what he was doing, the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing and God wanted to make this a colony of heaven. So although this is a Roman colony and had Roman laws, the, 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 the aim here was to make this a colony of heaven. And really, that's what you kind of see. And the introduction is very telling. It says here, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. Now notice this, because this is important. Paul doesn't say here, I'm an apostle. Now in some of the letters he does, doesn't he? He begins and he lets them know, I am an apostle, he says, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. Very often he says that. He doesn't to the Philippians. Why? Because they know he is. And so very often he would say that, particularly to the Corinthians. You know, the, the Corinthians are kind of questioning Paul and he says, no, 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 you need to know my credentials. And Paul was not ashamed uh, of going forward and saying, I really am an apostle. But he doesn't need to say that here. The other thing that we see here is that he's with Timothy. Paul and Timothy, both bond servants. Why does he include Timothy? Well, we saw the background. We saw that John Mark went back. We saw that there was this terrible row and we saw that Timothy was picked up. So Timothy would have seen um, Paul and Silas um, flogged and, and he's, he stayed with Paul for the duration What's important that we see here is that clearly Timothy was with Paul in, in prison. Now whether he was in prison with him or just standing with him, he's with him. Do you understand? So this man that he picked up at the beginning and he says, this is my man, he's there in prison in Rome. Whether he's there with him in prison or visiting him, he's certainly there. Now Timothy always gets kind of pushed into the background a bit, but... Just have a quick look at 1 Timothy 4 for a minute. 1 Timothy 4, 14. Because I think many of us are probably like Timothy. You know, there are some people that are kind of default, really brave people. You know, they're, they're the first one in the battle. But Timothy wasn't that kind of a person. Paul, or God, did not choose him because he was brave. So it says here one, in 1 Timothy 4.14, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you which was bestowed on you through prophecy, prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery, by the elders. So quite clearly, this young man had been called to, to come alongside Paul and he'd had hands laid on him. In 2 Timothy 1.6, if you read that, 2 Timothy 1.6, it says, For this reason I remind you, 
to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you by the laying on of hands. For God has not given to you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, if he's if Paul is having to say this to Timothy, who in church history is seen as an exceptional man of God, then how much more us? How much more do we need to kindle afresh or, or fan into flame that which, is, that which has been put there at the beginning, but it maybe needs fanning again? So he says to Timothy, look, Timothy, what's controlling you now, fear, What's controlling you, which is fear, is not from God. But what is from God is dunamos, power, love, and a sound mind. And maybe that's you. I don't know. I've had quite a few people get in touch with me at the start of this year that their heads are spinning. They don't know what's going on in life anymore. Christians. And there was a lot of people at the start of this year that are, they just don't know what's going on in the world anymore. And there is a fear which, which is beginning to creep in. Well, don't think that Timothy was a brave person. He wasn't. He was brave in the Lord. That's it, you know. And 1 Timothy 1, 1, Timothy 1, 1 to 4 tells us, really tells us the caliber of the man. So in 1 Timothy uh, 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Saviour, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, listen to this, remain on at Ephesus so that you, you, may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Do you understand what's going on here? He's entrusting Paul with the mother church, with the most successful work that he did. That's what he's saying. I am entrusting you, Timothy, with Ephesus. The greatest work that Paul ever did. And he says, I'm, I am trusting that you'll stay there and you'll stand your ground and you will instruct them. That's incredible. That's the caliber of this man. That's what Paul thinks of him. So if you go back to Philippians... It's important that we grasp this. Paul and Timothy together, writing a letter from prison in Rome, calling themselves bond servants, bond servants to Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now I want to pause for a minute and look at what this actually means. Because... You know, back in these days, the buildings were, were, were consummated and, and made to be holy things, whether it be pagan temples or even as time went on, churches. You know, they'd sprinkle them with holy water and this, that and the other. But this is important, and I think very often we miss it, is that actually we are all saints. Saints. We're all saints. And the word saint means to be holy or to be set apart. And before we go any further, I just want to look at this because it's important. Have a look at Acts for a minute. The book of Acts, chapter 9. Acts 9.13. You know, Paul isn't calling them saints because they're his converts. <laughs> Some people do that, you know, well, if they're my converts, they're saints. <laughs> but he says it in Acts 19, 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, Saul, how much harm he did to the saints at Jerusalem. He did this harm to the saints at Jerusalem. There were saints before Paul arrived. He's not calling them saints because they're his converts. They're called saints because they're born again and they belong to the Lord. Have a look at Romans chapter 1 verse 7. Romans 1 verse 7. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Well, actually, it just simply reads, called saints. Called saints. This is the church. We are 
saints. You know, in the Roman Catholic Church, you become a saint by this thing or that thing or by dying. No, 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 no. It's important to grasp, I believe, like I said at the start, I think the church has been in cruise control for a very long time. It's been so easy for us. And you, you don't need me to tell you that it's not going to be that way. The season that we're going into is not going to be that way. And we have to know who we are. We are saints. We have been set apart. We are the ecclesia, the called out ones, set apart by God, holy. And we're dynamic. We're dynamic. Do you understand what this is saying here? It's not the building, folks. It's not the building that's, that's set apart. It's the people that are set apart. Ephesians 1.18. Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And it's hard for us to understand this, but we are God's inheritance. He is so looking forward to inheriting us, the saints of God. What love, what incredible love. Jude 3, beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the, to the saints. To the saints. Do we know what we are? The early church did. Do we? Or are we in cruise control? And we're just, you know, a friend of mine's got a car that will actually park itself. It will actually reverse into a parking space itself. Unbelievable. You know, that we can swap lanes and do everything. And I think we, we, the church has been like this for so long. We're going to have to take it out of automatic, stick it in manual and start to really figure out th what the church has got here. The church has a power. We are saints. I, you know, my favourite gear is third gear. I love third gear because you can drop down from fifth straight into third, forget fourth, drop from fifth straight into third and put your foot down. Brilliant. Absolutely. When you can hear the tone of the engine, the engine just loves third. You know, the, we've got to get out of automatic and get it into third gear and put our feet down. In... Um, in um, Verse 14, it says, And it was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones, that is, his saints. His saints. Praise God. I mean, you know, seriously, imagine Christians that have been wet lettuces all their life. They just complete wet lettuces, um, riding back victoriously with Jesus to this earth. And, and, but in the life, they were just like, mm, not sure about this. It doesn't, doesn't really doesn't work, does it? He's riding back with saints. And then you get to Revelation. Uh, people don't like going any further, but you get, you get to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, verse 4, and it says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. And it's the prayers of the saints that ultimately brings about the, the, the wrath of God coming upon the earth. The prayers of the saints. You get to Revelation chapter 13. And in Revelation 13, um, in verse 7, it says, And it was given to him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them, we know we are a target. You've only got to look at what's going on in the world now. Forget about the future. People get so caught up with, you know, when is the rapture going to happen? And they argue and argue and argue about the rapture. Look at what's happening now. The saints are being targeted now in terrible ways, some of them. 
It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority was given them over every tribe, tongue and nation. And he, and he, and he says in um, verse, 11, uh, verse 10, if anyone is destined to captivity, he's going to go to captivity. You know, there was a, there was a pastor in the 1930s that in, in Belgium that spoke out against Hitler and he's, his whole congregation told him, please don't do that. Don't do it. You, 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 you need to be quiet now. And he carried on. Even the Lord Mayor came to him and, and said, you know, you, you need to stop doing that. Well, he didn't. And they, they, they came for him at three o'clock in the morning. They always you come at three in the, at that time, drag you away. They tortured him terribly, terribly. He's a saint. We're talking about saints here. He died in Daco. That's where he died. But we've got his letters to this day. We know the joy that that pastor had even in jail. Now, let's be honest, folks. We can't understand that. We can't understand that. And it's because we're in cruise control. Because we're in cruise control, we can't understand why is he in Philippians that Paul talks so much about joy? When, when he's in prison, why does he talk so much about joy? Why is joy such, such a thing? And it says here, it says, this calls for the perseverance of the saints. That the saints are going to have to persevere. I've mentioned this many a time. The word is supermone. If you give it to a, 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 a paraphrase today, it would probably be staying power. Staying power. Having done all, stand, persevere. Patience. It can be translated patience. But we are the saints. Not just back then, but at the very end, there's saints. Yeah. Now, either we are or we're not. Yeah. You know, make your mind up. It's make your mind up time. What was that? Huey Green, was it? <laughs> Opportunity knocks. I can't remember. It's make your mind up time. Are we saints or not? And we are in cruise control. And so at some point, we're going to have to take it out of cruise control and realize that this thing can actually drive. That that this thing that we're in has power. Okay, so let's go back to Philippians a minute. Go back. To all the saints of Christ Jesus, hallelujah, who are in Philippi, uh, including the overseers and the deacons, the pastors, the elders, the deacons, all of you. All of you. He says, grace to you and peace. Peace, the the Greek is is Irene, but really, don't forget, Paul is a Jewish man. And so the the word that he would like to use, but he can't use, is is the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom. And shalom carries much more power than any Greek word that tries to kind of convey peace. What he's conveying here is shalom. Shalom which is so powerful. I'm sure Viv understands, right? It it, it means to be totally complete. It's more than that, much more than that, but to be totally complete, no matter what. Shalom. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all remembrance of you. I always offering prayer for you for, for all of you, offering prayer for you all in view of your... Now, this is important. This is important. We've looked at the word saints. It's something that we don't really think about too much. But now there's another word here that, 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 that the future church has to get hold of. This is another one where you take it out of, out of automatic out of cruise control, and you, 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 you begin to understand something that the church has lost sight of. And the word is koinonia. Yeah. It is here, it's, well, in, my, in this translation, it's, it's participation. Sometimes it's translated fellowship, but it's so powerful. It's such a powerful word. So we say here, I always offering prayer with joy in my, uh, in my every prayer for you all, in view of your koinonia, participation, fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. 
This is so important. This is what separates the early church from what we kind of see today. And somehow we have to rediscover koinonia. So um, have a look at Acts chapter 2. We'll start there. Everybody, on, you know, everybody gets Acts 2 when it comes to this. But in the early church, they were, break, they were breaking bread from house to house. And it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, the word fellowship is koinonia. Now, what you see a lot of today is, you know, come along, we have a sewing club. Come along, we have a, uh, a watercolour picture club. If you want to... Um, you know, come and join our painting club, come along, or come along to this thing or that thing and, and, and join in, and they, they say, come along and have fellowship. Come along and have fellowship. That is not really what koinonia is. Koin, the koinonia is not just coming together as Christians and sharing some common hobby. There's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But that's not really what it is. It's coming together and through the Spirit of the Lord, connecting, partner, partnering together with one another in the things of God. Yeah. In the things of God. Yeah. You know, I remember when Mandy first came to our church um, um, down in Biddle. And after the meeting, it's the first time she'd been, and after the meeting... She was talking to some of the, the girls there about the message. I don't know who preached, but about the message. And she was told, she was told off by some of the girls saying, what, what's up with you? The, the meeting is finished now. We don't talk about things like that when the meeting's finished. You know, she was told off for it. Um, because it was seen as, you know, I don't know, I don't, I, beyond me. But, but do you understand what I'm saying? There is something about koinonia. You know it. You know when you found somebody that you can have koinonia with. You just know it. And what you'll find is this. They'll say, oh, I, was, I was reading this the other day in the Bible. I was reading that. And, that, oh, and you can talk for hours. You can talk for hours with somebody that you have koinonia with. And, and what I find is, is that with people like that, yes, you'll end up talking about the church. Yes, you'll end up probably talking about the demise of things. But the, 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 the kernel, the DNA of what you talk about is God and the word. That's koinonia. That's koinonia. And we have lost sight of it. We really have. Some people haven't. Some people never lost it. But have a look at 1 Corinthians 1 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship or koinonia with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So it isn't just with one another, it's with our Lord. We have fellowship with him. And what you what you begin to see is a network. It's an amazing network. So you have people connected th through koinonia, but this connection always goes to the, back to the, the triunity of the Godhead and then out again. So it goes to him and then out again. There's this incredible, invisible, global connection. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a koinonia. Have a look in um, 1 John 1.3. 1 John 1, be a really good to look at. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have what? Koinonia with us, fellowship with us. So John is saying, I, we want you to have koinonia with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father. Do you see that? So you have a fellowship with one, one another, but the fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you that our joy may be made complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 
If we say that we have fellowship, koinonia with him, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, and we have fellowship, koinonia, with one another, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This fellowship is so crucial to this letter, as you'll see as we go through. It's crucial. Paul understands something that we don't because we've been in cruise control for so long. But we go, we're going to have to. I don't think we're going to have any choice. We're going to have to rediscover what true koinonia is. And um, 2 Corinthians gives us a lovely... Uh, 2 Corinthians 13... Put just sums it all up. We could talk about coin only all day long, but and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The koinonia of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful, isn't it? I am with you always, Jesus says, even until the end of the age. Well, how is he with us? Well, Christ is in us, but the Holy Spirit draws alongside of us, the advocate, the comforter, the parakletos. It means to draw alongside and be with you, have fellowship with you. Hallelujah. So this is important. This is important. And I think with the letters, um, often these things get overlooked. But koinonia is key. And then he, then he says this, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And I, you know, friends, there's, there, there's so much. Let, let's just go, just go very quickly to, um, to Revelation. Just go to Revelation, um, Revelation 19 just for a second. Revelation 19, we see the saints... Revelation 19, 8. And it was given to her to clothe her in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The saints, the saints, the saints, the saints, the saints. He who has begun a good work. This is why we, 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 we sang it this morning. We raise an Ebenezer. That is, we raise a stone that says, thus far the Lord has been good to us. Now this is, this is the saints. This is just a kind of a, a loose look at the saints. They are apostles, they're prophets, they're evangelists, they're pastors, they're teachers. They are spirit-filled people that move in the realm of a word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the faith, gifts of healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the fruit of them is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. They are all witnesses of Jesus to the uttermost ends of the earth. This is what we are. Now let's be honest, even as you just look at a list like that, you know where you've come from, you know what the Lord has done in your life, but you also know you're not what you should be. We all know that. If you're really honest, we know that. Paul will go on to say that in Philippians. I'm pressing forward because I know where I've come from, but I'm not what I should be yet. And so here the promise is, the person that's begun a good work in you, folks, if we stick with him. And, and here's the thing. You don't just... Use promise box Christianity. You take that one verse, you know, out and you say, well, this is for me. The rest of the, this letter backs up what he's saying here. Yeah. Do you understand? Everything else that flows from this. But in, he who has begun this good work, thank God, he will see it through. I said it a couple of weeks ago. We are indebted to our God for everything. Not, not just the church, the heathen, the heathen. There's nothing that we have that doesn't belong to God. Nothing. You know, it's a sad, sad thing when, pe when people choose songs that are not appropriate for funerals. But I was talking to a funeral director this week. He says, it happens all the time now. 
It's all the time, inappropriate songs, songs that are just totally inappropriate because people don't recognize anymore that actually everything goes back to God. Your spirit goes to him, your body goes to the... Everything belongs to him, saved or unsaved. But the one that began a good work will see it through. And he says, he goes on to say, for I am confident of this very thing. You began a good work and you will perfect it even till the day of Jesus Christ. Read on. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Since both in my chains or in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. Now that's another derivative of koinonia it's sink sink koinonia it's coming together and syncing up with him in this I think that's what's missing I really do I think what's missing is we're not really synced up we're not really synced up together to the cause here you know we, we come along we do our bit we give the Lord an hour or two here and an hour or two there, but there's not that sinking up that the early church had. They, they, they really bought into this with everything. I mean, I can remember, I'm not that old, but I can remember when people financially gave up everything. They gave up their finances. Now, of course, today that would be you would be considered to be in a cult. Today, you would be considered to be in a cult to do that. But that was how it was not that long ago. People would give up so much. They were synced up for the cause of the gospel. And that's what he's talking about here. By the way, I'm not suggesting whatsoever that you... Uh, but, 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 but listen, people did it. You did it. You know, I, I can remember very many times people that, that were that just hadn't got the money to do this thing or that thing and the other thing. Oh, you... People were amazing. St being, being partakers in this together, in prayer, backing people up. <coughs> for God is my witness, he says, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ. That's incredible. What, what Paul is saying there is incredible. He says... God is my witness, I long for you the same way that Jesus longs for you. And the word is bowels, from my very bowels. You know, we say, well, I know it from my heart. They didn't used to say that. They used to say, I know it from my bowels. <laughs> I, I feel it in my bowels. But I kind of understand that, don't you? You know, very, if I get nervous, I don't feel it in my heart. I don't feel the nerves in my heart. I feel the nerves in my bowels. That's where I feel it, right there in my bowels. And you can feel affection for people right in the seat of your emotions, which is your bowels. And I, I mean, I've looked into this quite a bit, but the, um, bowels actually think. They're, they're capable of thinking. Anyway, that's... You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Now, this is really, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. That your love may abound more and more in real knowledge and discernment. Now, you know, we all know people, and thank God for that, they're lovely. We all know people that kind of just love everyone. And when you see them, in church, they're just lovely people, aren't they? You know, they just love everyone. And I thought, I wish I could be like that. You know, and it just love everyone. And, and it's all love. Everything's love, you know. And you think, praise the Lord. Thank God for people like that. But Paul always balances it off. He always balances it off. Because, you know, very often people that, they, 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 they haven't got any discernment, they, get, they just get swept away by anything. They just get swept into stuff all the time. But he says that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge. In real knowledge and discernment. Notice knowledge comes before discernment. Knowledge comes before discernment. And I would say this 
to you this morning. I mean, it says of Timothy, for instance, that from a youth, from a youth, he knew the scriptures. From a youth. What we, what we know from this is, is that the gospel is simple enough for a child to understand. And before we move into that area of discerning, the first thing you have to know is real knowledge. And I will keep on beating this, banging this drum until the day that the Lord takes me. Because the most important thing for you to grasp is the gospel. The most important thing to start with is the gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Don't start going into discernment before you've got the knowledge of the scriptures. It's when you know this, when you love this. You know when somebody know, knows the scriptures. I'm telling you folks, you know. They can't stop talking about the scriptures. They cannot stop it. I was reading this the other day. I was reading, you know, out of the mouth, the abundance of the mouth, the, the heart speaks through the mouth. I know them because it spills out of them. The word spills out. But we're living in this day and thank God the internet is both a true blessing and it's a curse. Is that people are just surfing and surfing. They're on this, they're on that, they're here, there and everywhere. No, please, don't take my word for it. Take Paul's word for it. First and foremost, you need the real knowledge of the scriptures. Let that sink in. Press the pause button. Switch the flipping internet off. Turn off your smartphone and just get into the word. Let Jesus speak to you through the scriptures so that you know that you have relationship with him. Not through some third party, but just you and him together. That you know that you belong to Christ and he belongs to you. You've got to know that. As my old pastor used to say, and he was absolutely right. He says, if you want to know a counterfeit, don't go looking at all the counterfeits. Study the real thing. If you want to know what a real ten pound note, uh, a counterfeit ten pound note looks like, don't look at all the counterfeit ten pound notes. Look at the real one. And when you've looked at it for long enough, you know what they like. These people on the checkouts, blah, 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 they know pretty quick because they're used to the real thing. This is so important. It's so important. I can't stress it enough because so many people are shipwrecked by going into the area of discernment before they've actually got that knowledge of the scriptures in them. Yeah. It's so important, church. Honestly, it's a lot easier for me not to say these things. It's much easier for me not to say them. It's a lot less hassle for my body not to say them. Having been filled, and so, 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 sorry, so that you may approve that word there is test, so that you may test the things that are excellent. And, and you have to in life. How do you discern, church? How do you discern whether you're marrying the right person? You know, that's a big one. That's a really big one. How are you going to know whether they're right for you? Well, you start off by knowing the love of God. You start off by getting into the word of God and allowing Jesus to speak to you because you're going to need discernment. You're going to need to test what things are right for you in life. How do you know? How do you know? And he says here, so that you may approve or test the things that are excellent. God wants only the things that are excellent for you, that are right for you, in order to be sincere. And, and that word there, sincere, is no hidden motives. No hidden motives. Or, and to be blameless, which is that, you, that you, you, do, you do not cause others to stumble. So that there's no hidden motives in you and you're not causing other people to stumble. Because woe to those who will cause other people to stumble. Woe to them. That you may approve. 
Test the things that are excellent in order to be sincere, or as, as, it, as it's put in, in Latin, without wax. I'm sure you know about the vases that they would sell and they would, they would put wax in the cracks and they'd paint over them. And uh, they looked like they were very expensive, but actually they got cracks in, they painted over with wax and nobody knew that actually what they were getting was not good. We, we have to be sincere. No hidden motives. We are not to cause people to stumble until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Hallelujah. Now I want you to know, brethren, I want you to know that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Amazing. Amazing. Um, what Paul went through. You know, what he went through. Uh, incredible. Uh, Paul went on, had three trials, just like Jesus had three trials. He had, a, he had to stand before Felix, Festus and Agrippa. Jesus had to stand before Caiaphas, Herod and Pilate. Three trials. And then, he, he, you know, after two years, I've been knocked from pillar to post, messed about, messed about. Paul eventually goes from on, on that ship from Malta to Rome. What a journey that was. The journey alone. Most people would have written a book about the journey. It would have been a bestseller. But that, that's just the way that he gets to Rome. And then from Rome, of course, he ends up in house arrest. And he's chained to a Roman guard. And Timothy's there with him. You know, Timothy's there with him. But he says, I want you to know that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. How incredible is that? And I've, I've said this many times, but I'll say it very quickly. There was a guy at Middle Pentecostal Church that had, he, he was a policeman, six foot two or something like that. He ended up being struck with MS, the worst kind of MS. It was shocking. It was shocking. And he ended up completely paralyzed, totally. His arms are stuck like this and... And he's a big guy, very strong, but and he, he was used to be a jack the lad in his time, you know, as a policeman. Everybody loved him. And we used to pick him up before an hour before the meeting for Bible study. And it was a very long, drawn-out thing. Getting Danny, putting him in his sling, putting it underneath his arms. He was a big, big guy, lifting him up with the thing, putting him in his chair. And I'll never forget him saying to me one day with tears in his eyes he says look at this look at this look at this and he turned to Philippians he says this is me this is me read it read it read it this is me this has turned out for the furtherance of the gospel Amen. and he was constantly witnessing to people yeah. and I'll never forget Danny as long as I live because I, sh I swear if he'd have had the physical ability he would have clouted me <laughs> but um I uh I was taking him down the bank to the to the church and his, his battery wheelchair had run out of juice. So it was just a normal wheelchair. And I lost control. I lost control of the blinking wheelchair. And he, and he went. And he went, oh! Like this. I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? He's going down going, oh! And you know those signs at the beginning of the roads that tell you what road it is? He clattered that with his hand. And he got, he's all scraped up and everything. I thought, he's going to kill me. He didn't. He never said a word. He's just grateful to get to church. That was Danny. Anyway, he's with the Lord now. But what a witness he was. We used to take him swimming, didn't we? He loved swimming. He loved, I mean, could hardly, he loved swimming. But that's what he said to me. This has turned out for me for the furtherance of the gospel. Incredible. Incredible. So that my imprisonment make. um, in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorium Guard to everyone else. People were getting saved. They were getting saved. As we'll see at the end, Roman soldiers, hardened Roman soldiers turning to Christ. That's incredible. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, <laughs> because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word without fear. That the word courage there can mean dare. 
you know. Remember when we used to play dares as kids? I dare you. I dare you to do that. I dare you to do the other. And, you know, we, um, the SAS, you know, who dares wins? Who dares wins? Well, you know, um, we see it in the Old Testament. I think we're going to start seeing a bit more of that when the, the, the car comes out of uh, cruise mode, yeah. that people are going to have to start to dare. Yeah. You know, I know that sounds crazy, but just to dare. Is John, there's a lovely verse in the Old Testament where Jonathan says to his armor bearer, perhaps the Lord will give us the victory. He doesn't say, God has told me. He doesn't say that. God has told me. He says, perhaps he will. If he doesn't, he doesn't, but he might do. He might give us the victory. Let's, have it, let's give it a go. Um, so, um, so he says, in my have far more courage to speak the word without fear. A phobos without fear. Uh, and, and I struggle with fear. I always have all my life. I struggle with fear. I struggle with standing up in front of people. It makes me ill. Uh, it's just a constant trying to conquer fear all the time. And you never, you never fully conquer it, do you? There's always something else that comes your way. But it, I totally understand what was given to Timothy. When I was a young Christian, I was having panic attacks all the time. As a young Christian, panic attacks. Even when I met Mandy, I was constantly having panic attacks. And I had to quote to myself, God has not given to me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I had to prescribe myself that medicine under my breath at work. When people, God has not given to me for, 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 nobody knew, but I was constantly prescribing it to me. And I can remember one day thinking, what's happened to that fear? What's happened to that fear? You know, and God is good. Amen. God is good, but, but he's constantly trying to uh, draw us back into fear. Constantly. It's a constant thing. He says, some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and from strife, but some also from goodwill. I think this is amazing what Paul's saying here. And and, and because when we go through life, right, when when you're fighting fit and, and everything's going your way, the chances are, you know, you, you, you kind of like, I don't think you have as much grace. I don't think you have as much grace. And sometimes you can look at Paul and, you know, remember the time when he, re- he rebuked Peter openly, really, really rebuked him openly. When you look at Paul here, he knows he's coming to the end of his life. And there are things I think that, really, really wound him up, really wound him up. Here, he seems to be taking a slightly different stance on it. Illness humbles you. I mean, it really humbles you. But so does persecution. It's really very, very, very humbling. So here, there are people here that Paul says are preaching out of contentious, a contentiousness, a disputing spirit, a, quarrel, a quarreling spirit, strife, but some also from goodwill. Now, go back to 1 Timothy just for a minute because Paul carries on to talk about this. So he said, in 1 Timothy 1, Paul sends Timothy to his most important church. There's no doubt. He entrusts him with his greatest work. And so in, he says, um, he says, I'm sending you, I want to send you to, to, to uh, Ephesus. Sorry, it's not 1 Timothy, it's, uh, what did I say? 1 Timothy 1 4, isn't it? Sorry about that, yeah. So he says, He's sending them to Ephesus, verse 3. He says, don't pay attention to myths or endless genealogies, which was a big thing back then. 
which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith, but the goal of our instruction that is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. He says, some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they are, uh, they are confident about. And, and Paul says, don't get into these things. Don't get into these things. There's, when you go back to Philippians, this is what he says here. He's saying that there are those that are preaching from a wrong motivation. They're causing strife, contention. There are also those that are preaching from, from a, 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 a good heart. And he goes on, he says, um, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my impression. Now, this is incredible. That, that word distress is flipsis, flipsis, which is tribulation. There were people that were preaching against what Paul was saying while he was knowing that he's in prison, that he can't do anything about it, to actually cause him tribulation. They wanted to. It's horrible, isn't it? It's so spiteful. But Paul says, what then? What then? That only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed in this I rejoice. Now that for Paul is massive. Massive. Because if anybody's going to come down on you like a ton of bricks, it's Paul. But here at this point in his life, He's so humbled, he's so messed up, you know. He's, he's gone through two years of waiting and he knows his life's coming to an end. You, you can begin to see a, a, a kind of a softening in him, but basically what Paul's saying in a nutshell here is, God will sort this mess out. God will sort this mess out. And God will. God will. And he says, for I know this will turn out for, for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, that with all boldness Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And here, here, here it comes. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, David Pawson had a, a, very close, a very close preacher friend who got cancer. Some of you may, may remember, but he got cancer. And, um, and this is what he said to David Pawson. It, it was terminal. He said, he said to, to David Pawson, I am eager to stay, but I am willing to go. That's what he said. I am eager to stay, but I am willing to go. And David Pawson said to his best friend, you need to keep on praying until you can honestly say, I am eager to go, but I'm willing to stay. And, and he prayed it, and he prayed it, and he prayed it, until in the end, he could say to his best friend, I've got it. I didn't have it at the start. I, I, you know, I'm eager to stay, but I'm willing to go. But to get to that point in your life where actually you, what, what you want more than anything is you are eager to go, but you're willing to stay. Yes. I think that's incredible. Yes. You see, it's good, we, this is going to come to us all at some point or other in our lives. And we, folks, we, we have to come to terms. Some people do very quickly. Praise the Lord. Some people wrestle with it terribly. But Paul says it, for me to live is Christ. But to die is even better. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labour for me. But I do not know which to choose. I don't know. He says, I'm hard pressed from both directions. <laughs> I'm hard pressed having the desire, the desire, the craving to depart and be with Christ. 
for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith, and that you, you, your, your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming. And, and they really were, you know, <laughs> kind of proud of Paul. They loved him so much. They, they were the only church that kind of uh, supported him, really. You know, they loved him so much. Um, only, con- only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And this is so important. And, and you know, you ca- you, it doesn't matter which letter you take, folks. This is so important that we strive together. We are one together, one in spirit, one in mind, striving or struggling together in the faith of the gospel. That is key. It's key. Like I said the other day, they say there's around about 30,000 denominations and we, we ha- right now, Islam is, is taking full advantage of that, full advantage of that, sweeping through Europe, sweeping through the world, while, while the church is so busy just caving in all the time on so many things. We, we, we have to get this. We have to take this thing out of autopilot and we have to find true koinonia church. People that you can sit down and you can bounce back and forward with the word of God and it just flows from you. I had my father-in-law. He was a spiritual father to me. We'd be up all night talking. I'm not kidding you. Till four or five in the morning. We were one. One in Christ. Bouncing the word of God back and forward, back and forward. There's nothing like it. It's tremendous. I do that with my wife all the time. We talk about Jesus. We talk about the word all the time, back and forward. One, together, koinonia. This, I don't know whether we've got this the same as they had it back then. I don't know whether we have. But you, the Lord will, will search out people for you where you can have this. And it's so invaluable. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, that, that two, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And that's where we get the word paschal, the paschal lamb, the suffering lamb. Yeah. That's where we get it from. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now you hear to be in me. Let me just finish with Philippians 3.10, and we'll finish this morning. Even Paul said, I I have not arrived. I have not arrived. Folks, we never arrive down here. There's so much to learn, or as Ray often says, you never graduate from the school of hard knocks. You don't. Nobody ever does. We never arrive. But this is, Paul says this, that I may know him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the koinonia of his sufferings. The koinonia of his sufferings. You see this? Do you understand why I'm saying this morning we know so little about this today? But I don't think we're going to have any choice. I used to have a Mazda Bongo that um, was automatic. And if you went down a steep hill and automatic, it was like a runaway horse. It was so dangerous. It just couldn't keep up with the, the, the bank. You had to take it out. And you had to put it manually into gear. Otherwise, you wouldn't stop. You'd, just, you'd crash at the end of the bank. And the church has been drifting along now, just drifting and drifting and drifting. We have to come to terms and discover what does this real koinonia look like. And here, 
in chapter 3, and we'll get to it in a couple of weeks' time, he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the, and the koinonia of partnering, partnering with him in his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Amazing, isn't it? That's Philippians, church. That's Philippians. And this is what I find about Philippians. It's not what you call a reactive letter. It's very proactive. There's no, there's, you don't really see Paul really telling... You don't, you don't get told off so much. But what you get in this letter is you see such a purity that you're convicted by that. <laughs> You're actually convicted by the purity of Paul and his relationship with the church. It's not because Paul's telling you off. There are people in this life, and sometimes you meet them, and there was this old man, and I met him, and, and he said to me, I want you to come to my house. And, he, and he, he, lived, he lived down south, and he says, I want you to come along, and this is the time you're to come, and this is the day you're to come, and all this. So I... Dr drove all the way down to where he lived, which is Rugely, quite a, quite a long way off. And um, and he had and, and his house was called Koinonia, Koinonia, and and he was a, he was an Oxford prof uh, professor, you know, he's a very intelligent man that had pastored a lot of churches in his time. And I'd go in to Donald's house, and he was so regimented. You, you, have to, you used to have to go in, and he would say, now sign the book. And you have to sign the book, date it, put the exact time on that you got down there, and that he'd strategically set you in this certain place. Every time you drink this coffee together that was always lukewarm and ended up with that horrible skin thing on the top of the coffee, but you couldn't complain because he was, the, he was such a pure-hearted gentleman. He was in his 80s. He'd been there. He'd done that. He got the T-shirt. He pastored three churches at one time in one go together, just going from one to the other with people in charge and stuff. He was an amazing man, and he would sit me down, and I would sit down, and he'd just stare at me first. He wouldn't say a word, he'd just stare at me. All right, stop staring at me. What can you see? What is it you can see in me? <laughs> he was so pure. The man was so pure. And then he'd say, now let us pray, you know, and everything was done exactly the same time, every single time. Now tell me about your church. And we'd talk about the church, and then he would start to ask me questions that kind of, you know, were designed to get under your skin a bit, and... Oh my goodness, sometimes you didn't know where to go with him because he was, he was just getting into you. And, uh, but it, at the end of it, at the end of your session, <laughs> with Koinonia's session with Donald, you had to write in his diary exactly what you got out of that session. The whole lot. And, and he was a remarkable man. He truly, of the people I know in my life, he knew what koinonia was. He really did. And I'll never forget once I, I went to, I met him at Litchfield Cathedral at the cafe. Anybody ever been to the, yeah? Very nice. And there was two, and he, he was with two guys, young guys. One of them was this fresh-faced guy, you know, really bright, bubbly guy. The other one looked like Quasimodo. And, it, and he was like bent over backwards like this and, like, like that, and he, and he told me, he says, we're going to meet up with two friends uh, uh, for some koinonia. He says, one of them is a, a heroin addict. Uh, and, and I'm looking at this guy, like, uh, uh, thinking, the poor fella, the poor fella, oh, well, the life is really, uh, you know, what's it to do? And we, we all sat down together for this wonderful koinonia, and it slowly dawned on me that he was the evangelist. <laughs> This guy is like this. He was the evangelist, like that. And the other guy that was just this chiseled young man, that was just a beautiful looking young man, was a heroin addict that had only got, as it turned out, two months to live. Yeah. And we sat down with him and we had koinonia with him. Donald, me, this guy like this. That's, you've never seen a guy in such a state. But he was out on the streets all the time telling people about Jesus. How wrong we can get people. How wrong we can get them.
but koinonia, friends. Real, biblical koinonia. Where you're not sitting down and talking about this, that, or the other. You're, you're, you're engaging with people about Jesus. Koinonia is so, so important. And it's going to become more important. And I would say this as we close off. I do say, thank God for the internet because what it has done, it's enabled us to see that we are actually completely interconnected over this entire planet. We're connected into one another. We're connected into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's this koinonia over this entire globe whereby we can get in touch with somebody and say, I am really struggling right now. They might be in Australia, they might be here, they might, and you can sit down and have koinonia with them. Praise the Lord. Amen. The koinonia of the saints. I think that's what I'll call this session. The koinonia of the saints. <laughs> Praise the Lord.